Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Adam. How are you doing? I'm um, still, still, still getting woken up. Nothing like a great cup of tea to get you started. Huh? Yeah, there is something. It's called coffee. Which is your inferior coffee, yes. There, there are some debates that we do not touch on uncertain <laughs> things. <laughs> so, too sacred. <laughs> Welcome to Uncertain Things. Welcome to Uncertain Things, the podcast where we talk about uncertain things. Except for the perennial coffee versus tea debate, which is which is not uncertain. We have 100% certainty on each of our sides on this one. <laughs> Except that your attachment derives in its entirety from the, the clasp of a dying post-colonial empire's fetishization of the Orient. Oh, let, let's not pretend that coffee is immune. <laughs> to that, to those colonial, colonial influences. Speaking of colonial influences, today we have Professor Moshe Slohovsky. He is a history professor at the Hebrew University at Jerusalem. Of Jerusalem? You would know that better. I mean, Google works just as well for you, but yes, it's of Jerusalem. And yes, I do have a personal connection because he is the guy who taught me how to think history. And, and I think he's... Uh, Back when I was a student, he was the head of the history department. Today, I think he's still involved in leading the humanities department there. He also taught in Princeton and elsewhere. And it's worth me taking a moment to just note how impressive the arsenal of history professors that department offered, at, at least at the time when I went there. There was Matthias Schmidt, who's this incredible human being and also classical world scholar. And of course, Yuval Noah Harari, who has since attained worldwide celebrity status. All of them were incredibly influential people to me. But Moshe Slohovsky is really probably the reason that I still see myself as part of the discipline of history, despite my occupation in journalism, which is clearly the uh, bastard cousin of, of history. As I mentioned in the interview, I feel there's a moment in the life cycle of every history student where after spending days poring over articles with titles like How did the potato famine in Ireland affect the view of homeschooled Catholic teenagers about the <laughs> military in the 19th century? You start asking yourself, what the fuck am I doing here? Seriously, what the hell is this? So for me, the answer came on my second year when I took Slochowski's class. And it was, I think, about colonialism. I think my entire curriculum was shaped around the, the worst of, of human history and, and I just find cruelty and uh, human capacity for darkness to be more interesting than potatoes, but it's not, no judgment. But what I remember struck me about uh, Slochowski's class Aside for the, the, the hefty ballast of knowledge about the topic that he possessed, it was how he was able to push every discussion beyond good and evil, beyond our desire, especially with things that still have tremendous political salience like colonialism, to have everything fit into our, our current ethical grids and have them satisfy our binaries of, of what's right and wrong. And, you know, usually when you hear somebody in the news uh, refer to history, it is to draw some moral comparison and say, history shows us why this idea should be vindicated, or history tells us why this guy needs to be demonized. And that's really boring history, not to mention asinine completely. And instead, what Slochowski did in his class was to show us how to stay in the discomfort of uncertainty, to be able to see the world, to try to see the world, how the people at the time understood themselves, while also being very mindful and critical of their blind spots, of their internal contradictions, and how these gave cover, if not actually blinded them to the true horrors which they were committing. But conversely, to understand that the horrors don't mean that the lofty ideas which the same people were espousing were nothing but a lie. That scholarship of the Enlightenment and those quote-unquote liberal values that were uh, born out at the time were, were not just a way to mask colonialism. They, those were ideas that were developed with real meaning, real intent behind them. And the difference between seeing that as a glaring blind spot and internal contradiction as opposed to just a propaganda tool and a lie makes all the difference in the world to me 
It's the difference between doing real rigorous history and doing politics. And I think it also expanded the way that you uh, evaluate and analyze current events and the, our own blind spots in the current moment. Yes, exactly. That, that, that's what was so formative about his class. And you can't leave it without constantly asking yourself, what are our blind spots? And will we even ever be able to understand them? And the way he would foster this uh, type of double vision would be letting the debate run free in class, and then every once in a while interceding only to like, throw some, some factual bomb to, to destabilize the discussion. And in his arsonist nature, he did it in a way that always destabilized the side that seemed to be winning the argument, just to make sure that nobody becomes unduly confident in their views. Uh, of course, he didn't shy away from the tried and true pedagogical method of, of eviscerating students for their ignorance. And I personally used to take a lot of masochistic pleasure whenever his scathing, withering tone was directed at my ignorance. That's interesting. I wouldn't have necessarily assumed that from our conversations because we, ha we had two conversations. The first one was unpublishable due to audio issues. And this is our second. And in both interactions, I, f I found him incredibly um, accepting and encouraging. And I wouldn't have necessarily assumed that he would have been quite... Um, I don't know. The way you're describing it sounds like it was a bit of an aggressive <laughs> uh, response to, to students' ideas and, and uh, formulations. Ag aggressive is not necessarily the right word because his tone <laughs> doesn't really rise above the <laughs> snide hum that you will hear in the interview. But right. I also suspect that he was um, being a gracious guest. Right, right, right. Which makes sense because if we were a student, he'd be pushing us to, to think deeper, go back to the, re the research. And yep. But this also brings me to the other pedagogical tool that he uses, which is his ever-present caustic continence. And the, the podcast listeners won't be able to see this, but at any given point, there is this sardonic grin unfurling on the corner of his face. And I see it as something more than a disarming quiddity, but as a, a truly valuable attitude especially when approaching the darkest corners of, of human history. To be able to truly, studiously, meaningfully look into the abyss, mm -hmm. you need irony. Without irony, we are stuck with only white hot rage. That's unhelpful and pretty boring. Right. Last thing I'll say in regards to this backstory is that the thesis I wrote for one of his classes back in 2011, 2012, was actually about a progenitor of what now gets crammed under the title of critical race theory. I was interested in doing some survey of intellectual history, so I focused on changes that were happening in the American Academy, specifically around justice reform. And I was truly fascinated to, to read some of the scholarship that pushed back against the axioms of a justice system founded on Enlightenment values, ideas like uh, 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 liberty, merit, objectivity, and arguing that while these ideas pretend to be neutral, they in truth carry the weight and biases of the colonial project. And I found it fascinating, but I was also Equally fascinated by the, the pushbacks, and I, and I uh, quoted several thinkers at the time, including, I think, Judge Richard Posner, who claimed that while we certainly need to reckon with the residue of colonialism, to completely append ideas like objectivity and, and liberty and merit would be, and I might be misquoting, uh, nuts. And I believe I concluded the work with a very ambivalent tone, as is my want, saying something like, this is an important challenge to force us to confront our blind spot and complacent assumptions and hypocrisies. But I also added that if this becomes more than an analytical tool, if this becomes more than a means to expand our vocabulary and turns into a real program, then things could get really scary. And just remember the notes of exhilaration and trepidation mixed with a, with a little bit of terror that I felt while, while researching that work. But this was 2011, 2012, 
way before any right wing uh, 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 tabloid has, has even heard about critical race theory. For good or ill, this shows how powerful the, 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 the intellectual framework of, a, of our society can be. Academic work can be more than... Intellectual, uh, masturbatory. Right. I, these are ideas that have escaped the academy and are now affecting and, 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 and pushing against everything in our society. And, and, and in some places, perhaps for the better, and in some places, certainly for the worst. But again, and not to be a broken record about this, it seems that the problem, whether with the way critical race theory is spreading or the reaction against it, is the complete unwillingness to grapple with complexity, the, that total unshakable commitment to hero-villain narratives. And we get into that in the, in the conversation, and we, and we talk about you know the fact that that dynamic is sorely missing from a lot of current conversations about history but we also get into how important it is that at least in america we're, we're starting to wrestle with these different competing narratives and we talk about the the positives and the negatives of 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 this dynamic right now and it's it is interesting to get his take on what's happening in history right now um, he brings up uh, different con- like historical debates that happened in the 60s and the 80s and the 90s and where, where we are and how we're thinking about it. And we get into some really interesting stuff about wh- where he thinks we are as a, as a young nation dealing with its you know, traumatic past. It's a little funny now that I think about it because I, I basically invited him here to talk about the, the, the fields of history that, that I care about, not necessarily his main passions, but um, A, our podcast, our rules, and B, it's really his broader approach to history that I wanted to bring here. But uh, we should definitely uh, uh, bring him on again. And with that, we bring you Moshe Slachowski. Hey, Moshe. Hey, hey. You're going to have to excuse me for not being able to look directly at you. I'll excuse you. You're excused. All right. We are giving this another shot. Let's start with the basics. Tell us about yourself. Rich, I don't remember anything what we did last time, and I tell you about myself. So I got uh, interested in history early, uh, very early on, and every good friend, childhood friend who says that it was clear that I'm going to become a professor of history when I was already in middle school, maybe high school, and I don't remember it, but I thought I was going to become a psychologist, a clinical okay. psychologist, but she obviously knew what she was talking about. I started history and psychology at the university and really... F- Within a year, decided I want to concentrate on history. I did my BA and MA uh, at the Hebrew University, BA in German history, and MA in medieval French history, then got a PhD uh, here on the East Coast at Princeton in French early modern history. Early modern is the period between the Renaissance and the French Revolution. And I uh, have been teaching a uh, French history and religious European history, mostly history of Christianity, until about five or seven years ago, mostly in Jerusalem when I got at the Hebrew University, when I got tired of the topic and went back to my first love, which has been German history. And that's what I've been doing again for the last five years, German 20th century history. What's, what, what is it about history? And I'm asking you this as a, and I'm not sure if I mentioned it in the previous conversation, definitely in one of our talks. But when I went to Hebrew University as as a lowly undergraduate, completely oblivious about what it means to go through academic life, it took me about two months to to dive into these existential questions of what the fuck am I doing here? Why? What is this all about? And it was only around my second year when I started taking your courses that the picture started to come together. I can start thinking, oh, oh, okay. So I'm wondering, what was it for you that convinced you that, oh, uh, this is something I'm going to be devoting my, my life to? Great question and a difficult one because of absolutely, as you started asking it, I realized that I don't have an answer. It's something that has come, has always come really easy. I think that there is still a deep love of psychology there. So in a way, it is psychology, but psychology of dead people. And and I think as much as research, what is important and has always been important has been the 
the pedagogical uh, aspect of it to make people get excited about asking questions. I assume it could have been done just as much in sociology or in many other fields, and I might have found myself intrigued just as much. And I, I think I just had fantastic history teachers in high school, two excellent teachers, and then at the university, and I was really studying with, with, with brilliant professors, and I think they just made, for example, the best example I can think of is like early modern European history. No one who comes to university has ever heard of a period called early modern. No one knows what it is. Uh, people know modernity and medieval and before or some dark ages, but in Greece and Rome, uh, early modern European history is such a different, strange category that really only exists in academia. It doesn't exist of, outside of academia. I had no idea what it was all about, and I was exposed to two professors that made me fall in love with the complexity of topics, of developments, of processes that took place within this three or four hundred years between 1450 and 1650 or 1700. And I said, wow, but it was totally conjectural. Can we? Can I ask what what's so oddball about this era? Um, partly because we, you know, let me let me do let me answer you historically. It used to be called. People have always been interested in it because it used to be called back in the old days, from Renaissance to the Enlightenment, or Renaissance and Reformation, and it was the glorious period of Western civilization, right? With the Renaissance, we have all these great artists and philosophers, and they are reinventing, reinventing civilization. And then white men get on boats and go and conquer the savages and make them um, civilized and bring culture to them. And then the big, the big, the big uh, uh, philosophers of the Enlightenment uh, make all of us better human beings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it has always existed. It just existed as a narrative that was so self-congratulatory and stupid that I think I was lucky enough to go and be there as a student at a time in which the generation of my teachers started challenging this stupid narrative and asking questions like, did women have a renaissance? Or when Martin Luther was preaching, what was Mrs. Luther doing? Or did the Native Americans, or as they called them, Indians, really welcome Western civilization the way we assumed that they must have or should have? Um, so there was a moment in which a lot of new questions were asked about this specific period, and I think there was a sense of discovery of newness to it, um, that was absolutely exciting. I said I wanted to be an historian of 20th century uh, German history and German Jewish history. But the Holocaust, of course, overshadows it. And I didn't feel that there was anything new I could say. Um, today, of course, I know that there is a lot of new things to say about everything. Um, but back then, there was a sense there is really nothing new I can say. But in this period between, as I said, 14, 15, 1452, uh, 1700 or 1500 to 1800, 1800, there is still, back then, of course, same today, there's been so much new that that, 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 had, that had not been asked in sophisticated ways, or at least that was the sense back then. I still, I still, I still agree with this. Yeah, there, there was still... The, 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 there was a generation of people who looked at this period, many of them were women, later on people of color, who really took the field and completely revolutionized it. Uh, so just I'll give you two examples from my own personal interests. Because the discipline of history, as we know it today, was to a very large degree something that was developed by German scholars in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, the, the, the Reformation which is central to German history, Protestantism, was crucial uh, 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 for history of this period. 
And the German historians created a model in which there were two things. There was the Reformation and there was the Counter-Reformation. The Catholics are the evil guys. The reactionaries. The reactionaries. When I got into the field, people were just about to stop calling it the Counter-Reformation and started calling it the Catholic Reformation and to ask in what degrees did Catholicism itself change between 1500 and 1800. And once you look at it like this, you can ask a whole set of new questions. I earlier mentioned the question of, did women have a renaissance? Up until then, no one knew anything. No one could say anything about the female scholar of the renaissance. Today we know that there are painters and there are authors and there are poetesses. They had not existed in the canon before the 1970s and 80s. So there really was a moment of a lot of excitement. And is it the novelty in itself, just the sense that this is a field that is undergoing changes and you're uncovering things hitherto ignored? Or for me, what I, the sense that I got listening to you, whether in your lectures or in, in your seminars, was a passion for the blind spot of the people at the time that you're studying. Not just uncovering now the story of the Renaissance of women, but seeing how it was completely non-existent at the time in the eyes of the people writing history back then. Yeah, it's all of the above. It's the, let's, let's, let's take colonialism. We can tell it the old way. The old way is good white people with good intentions and machine guns come to bring civilization to savages. At the end of the story, everybody is happy. Some savages are dead, but those that remain alive have the benefit of Western civilization. There is another way to tell it, which is everything was absolutely horrible. It was paradise before the white men came and destroyed everything. We were just happy, happy campers. There was no patriarchy, there was no tension, there was no war, there was no enslavement, nothing. Europe exported its unique brand of perversion of nature and put humanity itself in shackles. Yeah, right. And I think that the role of a teacher of history is to show students and to investigate and to write books about the complexity and the intermingling of these different stories and that the triumphal traditional white man's story is wrong and that the Everything was happy before white men was also wrong. And to show the different complexities of different interactions among human beings. And I hope I'm doing it in my research. I'm definitely doing it in, in my classes. And there was the sense that in the specific period that we're talking about, there was a need for and a space for a huge amount of, of rethinking and revisions. What I recall from our previous conversation, and I know it was a while ago, um, and but but the thing that stood out to me from that conversation was the the way in which uh, we assume history happened because of what's left and all the things that that leaves out. And I believe we even got, got on the topic of things like archaeology, like alternative ways of getting to a sense of the picture of what that time period was that isn't just the three pamphlets that survive. Because if you if you just have those pamphlets, you're going to create a whole world around those three pamphlets that may or may not may could be completely inaccurate to what, what the bigger picture was. It is interesting to bring back the question what are we basing our view of history on? Right. So one of the things, again, and it's, it's actually very good, Vanessa, that you're taking me there, because I think I've ignored a very crucial aspect of the whole thing. In this period between 1500 and 1800, we have, quote-unquote, just the right number of documents to work with. Because if we're looking before that, we only have a very restricted small number of documents that survived. And what survived, mostly monasteries, some state municipal archives, is what people in positions of power wanted to, to, to copy and wanted later generations to be able to read, whether it's religious texts, whether it's municipal, whether it's legal, ordinances, etc. When we're coming to the modernity, we're overwhelmed 
by the amount of material that is out there in the archive. When you're talking about 1,500 to 1,800, <coughs> there are still huge archives that no one had looked at until the 1960s, 70s, 80s. And because it was not the kind of official document that people had been paying attention to, but it was also in the quantities that a historian could spend two or three years reading through all the material. We can do, or friends of mine did, history of adoption of toddlers in Paris between 1500 and 1700. And why is it interesting? Because when you look at, she was a colleague of mine, so we're talking the same time period. If you look at the French law, the French law said adoption is forbidden by law. And historians up until the 1980s assumed that if this is what the law said, this must have been the case, right? There are no adoptions in France. And if you look at books about the history of the family, you see there are no adoptions in France. However, once she started going to the archives, she found in notarial records agreements between, just an example, right, a seamster and a, and a carpenter, and the seamster is giving her son basically to be adopted, um, by the carpenter and his wife so that he will learn the profession and inherit and so on and so forth. He also inherits the carpenter's last name to the degree that there are last names, which is uh, pretty rare at the time, and so on and so forth. So, it was possible to spend a year in the archive and to find a hundred cases of adoption and to make a new claim about adoption that contradicted what the law said and therefore to ask, to, to open a whole set of new questions. What is family formation? How do families form? How do people feel about adoption? And so on and so forth. A question that had not been asked before, a question that we cannot ask about the Middle Ages because we only have the very, very few legal official documents that survive from the period. Okay, so this, I think, is just, so this is another element of it. This is a period about which we can cover a lot and not to be overwhelmed. When you're experiencing that moment of novelty, of, of seeing new things, of seeing new ways to read history and finding stories of people who have been r written out of the narrative, we're talking about the 80s for you, um... I, I assume it started before me, right? It started in the sixties, right. but yeah, I encountered it in the late eighties. Yeah. How does it translate now? Because one of the things that I encounter today is the sense that history becomes almost too diffused to the point where everything is a story, and as a discipline of 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 trying to thread together not necessarily a grand narrative but some ideas of of what happened and what to draw on gets lost right get lost and get politicized because i think the last 30 years have been completely under the sign of marginal groups one insisting on inserting themselves into history into the big narrative of history Inserting themselves also means demanding revisions, demanding a new canon, and demanding recognitions of evils. So the narrative has to be rewritten. The number, narrative ought to be rewritten in ways that are multivocal, that are complex. They don't do injustice to anyone in this complexity. The people with vested interest in telling the traditional story. The people with vested interest in in telling their own story of victimhood. I think we are in a moment in which there is a huge fight within the discipline of history, just as it is within English literature or anything else. American American politics, American sociology. What is the story? And we saw it just recently with the two narratives of the history of the U.S. history, right? The, do we put slavery at the center of the story or do we put the founding fathers at the uh, center of, of, of the story? And obviously we cannot right now reach a consensus about how to tell the story. But I will go a step further and say how lucky it is not to have a consensus about the story, because we should not have a consensus about the story. We should never have a consensus about the story. And if I were writing textbooks, even for sixth graders, 
I would insist on not telling them the story or a story of, for example, American history. I would, in, I would make them, at age 10 or 11, already see the complexities of possible stories that could be told. I guess it highlights the difference between what you might call the hard sciences in history, as it reminded me of the controversy in, I think, 2004 around the attempt in, in several American school boards to introduce intelligent design as a means to backdoor creationism. And an argument you'd hear all the time on the creationist side was teach the controversy, teach both intelligent design and evolution. And when it comes to supposed scientific consensus, it feels absurd to say, teach the controversy, teach the conflict. So what about people who, who would argue that history needs to take itself more seriously? It needs to present a fact-driven account of the past, regardless of what we think might serve some social purpose. Of course, you can always order the details to, to paint the picture you want. But when it comes to actually getting the facts, like, did Hitler directly order the execution of the final solution? That's a question that begs an answer that goes beyond the, the n different narratives that each answer would potentially serve. And it would serve specific narratives and specific social agendas. But history needs to go beyond that conflict. I agree. Why teach that the Earth circles around the sun and not that the sun circles around the earth, right? What gives us the authority to not let people who believe that the earth is flat to also teach their theory in schools? Same in history. At the end of the day, historians tell narratives, which is to say they create narratives. We take 1,000 events that did happen, and no one is denying their happiness. I'll give you specific examples in a minute. But out of the many events that did happen, we choose some and predetermine because of our political convictions, because of the way we were raised, because of all kinds of things, that they were more important than others, and therefore we can regard them as causes and not just not merely events. Not just noise. Not just, no, yeah, background noise even, right? Right. Important. In the moment I say to myself, some, some, sometimes unconsciously, this is important, I make it from an occurrence into an event. And now it becomes an important historical, or let's put it differently, facts and events, right? Facts happen. I, the historian, decide that a fact is a event, in a sense that this is a historical event. This is an act of creative writing. The facts in and of themselves do not come with a numerical importance. This is number one important, and this is number five in its importance. So we always do this kind of thing. And in an ideal world, there should be thousands of competing narratives playing in an equal field. Every historian should have the right to create his or her own narrative. In a way, this is what is actually happening in the profession. And there was a moment, a postmodernist moment in history, in which some people argued this is just like creative writing. This is just, history is just like literature. There is no difference between what a historian is doing and, and what a fictional author is doing. Uh, they are creating literary plots, they are creating, they are inventing causalities. The causalities are not there in the facts, but they are being invented by the author. And I accept the challenge, I agree. They are being created by the authors. However, and the answer to this question is not mine, but is, is a, of, of, of three wonderful historians that wrote together a book that I thought was, the, that I teach every year because I think it's so good. The book is uh, Telling the Truth About History. Uh, um, Margaret Jacob, Joyce Appleby, and Lynn Hunt, three historians um, at uh, UCLA, and they said, we accept the challenge, but the answer to the challenge is not 
therefore let accept all possible narratives out there. But let's set a set of rules about what are the basic demands that a historian should meet in order to give credence to her narrative. And within a democratic society, and democratic society is crucial here, when she is writing according to the rules of the discipline, we can assume that a specific causality because that's what historians do, right? Causalities. That a specific causality is the one that makes the most sense until we come up with a new interpretation that a democratic consensus would agree that it is a better one. So they, the, the rule is we'll have a set of standards not for determining whether one narrative is better than another, but for judging whether the process for arriving at a narrative is appropriate or legitimate. Right. We have rules about shortening quotations, right? When we quote in all kinds of sciences, um, I'm just inventing an example, right? And then, I will not say Trump, it will go into a ancient history, right? When John F. Let's say that John F. Kennedy said about something, it should never happen that, and whatever. And a historian is writing, quoting, it should, three dots, happen that, omitting the not, this is a betrayal of an agreement between author and reader, because... Within the discipline, the historian takes an obligation not to falsify the meaning of a quote. And if I took out the not, I completely change 180 degrees the meaning of a quotation. This is illegitimate. So it's a code of ethics, really. It's a code of ethics, if you want to call it. And not only that, it is my responsibility as a professional historian to do what looks like technicality, but I think is crucial to write footnotes, which is an agreement between me and the reader saying, you, the reader, can and in fact should go and check for yourself. But the problem with footnotes is that you're not showing what you're not showing. That's and part of the, the trick of telling a story in history is your selection of the sources. If you want to tell a story about um, the Trump uh, campaign to to delegitimize Biden's election. You can go through all the thousands and thousands that you know it opens up a whole conversation of of, of the superfluity of of information in the digital age, which is what we just talked about with Martin Gurry. But you go, you can take all those tweets and and affidavits of people saying that they witnessed election tampering and put all of it. It's a very compelling case if you're not showing all the judges who struck it down. Mm -hmm. it contextualizes with these are people that have been primed to see this. All the, all the points of doubt that belong in this story could easily be omitted to tell a very compelling argument that the election was stolen from Trump. Sure, I agree. And therefore, within a democratic society over X number of years, a consensus will develop among professional historians determining the quote-unquote true narrative of what happened. It's going to take time. Some people will not accept it. Some people still think that Darwin is wrong. I'm going back. Some people still think that the earth is flat. But at the end of the day, it is indeed the case that Darwin and people who support Darwin insist that this is a theory. And this is the best theory that we have come up so far. And it does not mean that it will not be slightly changed in this or that direction. And they are never claiming to know the truth with a capital a, a, a T, which is very different than arguing that creationism, because creationism do not have neither the, I don't even know what the name of the science, right? I don't know what these people do. It's <laughs> geologists, it's, it's <laughs> zoologists. It, what? Biology? Biologists, I don't know. But this, this, these people... Magical realism? 
magic is these people who do this kind of thing they're playing in a completely different field right they say the source of authority is not the footnotes right? it is not the things that we find out there uh, but it's a sacred text it's a completely different game so we just spoke uh, with Martin Gurry and and in his book he talks a lot about how in recent history the vi- visual media uh, photographs video, these are the things that are that are compelling movements, right? And so often there's no context around these things that are spreading like wildfire and stirring up emotion and movements and protests. And I'm just curious, d- does does that difference in the media, does that the the form of the me- the medium, I guess in this case, the visual imagery, does that change the way that you imagine? the way we we need to kind of i guess where am i going with this question i guess i guess because when i'm thinking of what the historian does it's so often words right it's so often documentation it's so often trying to get get meaning from from the way that other people have already strung meaning together and when you're working with visual media it's is without this context does that change what the historian has to do to 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 understand what's happening in in a time place time period sorry to make it to make it more concrete uh, what the example that that uh, we brought us up in in talking to guri who's a who was a media analyst for the cia and and wrote his his book about the root causes of of current upheavals connecting it to the um tsunami of information that the uh, digital media has wrought and his example was uh, of the video of uh, police killings. Specifically, we talked about the, the killing of George Floyd. Is this, this image of a police officer crushing uh, the neck of a, of a black man um, while, while the man is gasping and crying for help. So this is an incredibly powerful video. And, but but as, as, as a piece of history, what do you make of this? How do you understand it? And, and how does it distort our ability to even write history when the emotional impact of it is so strong and overriding that we um are we even able to discuss it as as a as a real artifact and not as a as a tool of propaganda um uh, i'll say two things um i'm speaking as a historian not a, an art historian i to, to the best of my knowledge and i'm on two phd committees now of people who are using visual art as the main source to the best of my sense of my knowledge um, i've not seen professional historians not art historians who know how to deal with visual evidence in sophisticated ways by 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 which i mean the the, the, the discipline of history has developed uh, for five, six, seven hundred years um, techniques to analyze rhetorical ways of argumentation. Uh, just a silly example, but when, when we say, usually when people say, it goes without saying that, it means that what they're going to say in the second half of the census is pretty debatable, and it's pretty not self-evident. This is a wonderful rhetorical means of presenting a weak argument with a language that makes it sound much stronger than it actually is. And we have lots of examples like this, and you can come up with them yourself. So we know how rulers turned defeats into victories. We know the language of influencing people when it is, when we're talking written language. I have not seen historians who are good about doing it when it comes to visual language, and I think there is something extremely naive about the way professional historians deal with visual images. I think we historians have to learn much more from people who do art history and to incorporate it because we are shifting from a written to a visual moment in history, and most of our students experienced world in images and not in written texts. I think my nephews cannot probably even identify the ABC 
but they are much smarter than I am in analyzing images. So, so we have to work harder. We historians have to work harder. We have to learn from art historians, film historians, and so on and so forth. I assume, from the little I know, that again, this is a language. The visual language is also a language that is extremely, extremely easy to manipulate. So where is it heading? I have absolutely no idea. But I think that I think that what I have seen so far is that historians in the traditional discipline of history are really not very good about incorporating. I'll give you a, maybe the most extreme example is not even news visual material but 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 movies. People learn history from movies. Historical movies uh, are, are, are most of the time superficial, simplistic, one-dimensional, and wrong. But this is the source of historical knowledge for, for, for 99.9 percent of the people in the world. What should professional historians do about it? I don't know. Can they do anything about it? I don't know. Does it make historical movies a, 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 a wrong? No, there's nothing wrong about them because professional historians wrote wrong, mistaken, falsified narratives, written narratives for as long as they have been writing history. So, so it's not that there's something new here. It's just something that that is extremely challenging and that we professional historians are just not not good at it yet. The one thing that I would say might be new that we're not fully grasping yet is that we we haven't evolved not just as a discipline of history but as a people the skills needed to be critical of the visual mediums um, as we have when it comes to texts we are just as people better at reading text and be a little critical who wrote it why, when was it written what's the the agenda there but uh, the emotional, the visceral effect of, of watching a movie can completely override our, our intuition for, for judging veracity. And we just, we just accept it. The, <laughs> I know it even about myself when I try to be critical about a, a movie, but if I watch a historical movie, that the, the, the depiction of that character in that movie will probably stay with me. And whenever I will think about this historical character in the future, I will still imagine the actor portraying them in the movie. And that's, that does a lot. That does a lot more than I think we're, we're even beginning to fully understand. I mean, there, there have been you know, 50, 60 years of uh, scholars grappling with this topic but i don't think as, as as a society and even as a discipline we've reached a point where we're truly um um um, um grasping the how how much we are constantly being manipulated by this hmm. and, and it's not just the veracity right it's to to moshe's earlier point it's like it's there's such a lack of complexity in the way that these these not these historical films are being are being told because they're trying they're and it it says so much more about our current moment and how we are interpreting these past events to fit into some sort of tidy story that makes sense for our current moment rather than embracing what would have been a bit, probably a much messier more complicated uh reality uh because that's what we're looking for right now <laughs> And conversely, it explains our general discomfort with the type of paradoxes, contradictions, and dialectical tensions that we care so much about, yeah. and, and, and Chloe mentioned in our talk with her, and, and that Moshe was um, discussing. And I want to recommend to you the best historical movie ever made that deals with this issue, which is Walker. The Walker is about the American occupation of the Cabacos is a racist pig, I don't know, but I think it's Nicaragua, but one of the small states in Central America in order to build a canal and it tells the story of Roosevelt and the guy who is the owner of the this or that banana company building the canal it, 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 is a it is a historical movie that breaks apart all the conventions of historical movies. And, 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 and when people shoot each other, it's like ketchup that 
comes out of them rather than blood and so on and so forth. And it's wonderful, but it really trains us as viewers to see the triviality, boredom, stupidity of the 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 narrative forms of, of, of historical movies. So I, I think it's a fantastic it's a fantastic it movie. So it does so totally intentionally. Yeah. Totally intentionally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's totally a historical anachronistic. It takes elements from uh, Italian westerns, which are even worse than American westerns, and mix it up with all kinds of traditional John Wayne things. With it, it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. But so, and it's intentional deconstruction, isn't yeah. it? Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. But Vanessa, I'm sorry, sorry. But when I, so if I go up to back, you say yeah, it's superficial, etc. That's wonderful. But imagine, would you pay? I don't know, 25 bucks to sit in a movie house and to see a historical movie in which, I don't know, the same narrative would be told seven times from seven different angles and you end up not knowing anything and, and have no idea what really happened. I think you want to see a movie because you want a beginning, middle and end. You want to get a narrative. You're going to sense a, sen a sense of closure. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm watching something now that is really awful and I enjoy it tremendously, which is Versailles, and it was my field, and I taught it, history of, of, of Louis XIV. It's so, historically, it's so bad. <laughs> it, it's, I couldn't get any worse than that. But it's fantastic. Well, for I, example, give us, a, give us a bad, give us a gripe <laughs> as a professional watching the movie. Ah, that's something that happens in the 1660s, or something that happened in 1760s, 50s uh, is incorporated into the movie about the 1660s because it's dramatic, because it's very interesting. Uh, there is a character, the brother of, of, of King Louis, uh, and that we know that he, uh, he was a homosexual, mm -hmm. he had homosexual uh, uh, relations with uh, his, his minions, his, his the, the noblemen who were close to him. Uh, but they portray him, and especially uh, one of his lovers, his main lover, as Bitchy Queens from, from Manhattan from the 1980s. Um, but they overdo it to such a degree that you understand that they understand that there is something going on here that is more sophisticated than, than just saying, oh, really bad script. I have no doubt that when I will think from now on, on I'll say more than that. Not only when I will think about Louis XIV, I will think about the British guy who is playing Louis, that when I teach, if I teach Louis, disregarding all the awful things I just said about the movie, I will send my students to watch Versailles <laughs> because it gives students a wonderful sense of atmosphere and beauty and luxury and, and eroticism. So let's forget about the narrative. Let's look at the surroundings, and then you you, you can learn a huge amount. Mm. It's funny. I'm I, in my mind. I was thinking of an opposite example because I just I interviewed recently a woman who's an expert on Madam C.J. Walker, who's a, a black female entrepreneur yeah. in American history. Um, right. And there was a Netflix series that came out recently on her and. And Madam C.J. Walker and Booker T. Washington had a very complex relationship that started off quite adversarial, but over time became kind of one of mutual respect. And the film completely glosses over all the nuance of that relationship and just kind of sets him up as almost like a bad guy, I think, um, mm -hmm. in the series. And when the historian describes the kind of the interactions between them, it's such a powerful story about how this woman was able to overcome the kind of gender stereotype that this man had about her. And over time, they became like kind of like a, a, a force to be reckoned with together. And she was just so disappointed that in the in that kind of like Hollywood rendition, all of that nuance is taken away. All of the complication of the relationship is taken away. And they just kind of become, you know, angel villain and you just you because she's the protagonist of this particular story they they kind of you know make it super simple and and that's kind of more what i was imagining and thinking of you know the negative side of the way we, that when it gets too tidy that's kind of just i think indicative of a lot of the ways we think about uh history and the complications of of having uh competing narratives in one in one life story and the consequences go beyond our ability to think back on history, the, we are seeing how, as as 
you know, as our friend Misha would, would bring up, we're seeing the, the realization of the Neil Postman entertaining ourselves to death dystopia, where that kind of oversimplified structure of, uh, they had some conflict between them, uh, therefore he is the villain of this story, playing out in, in, in real life. And, you know, when you were talking about this, my brain went to m- my frustrations, not with any historical film, but with the adaptation for his dark material. <laughs> I'm a fan of the original Philip Pullman books, and I have my quibbles with the way that they adapted the story. And it's this kind of mindset I increasingly begin to suspect that dominates a lot of our social thinking, let alone our historical thinking. When we are judging events in our current political moments, as well as as, as an historical narrative, we are motivated less and less by whether we are convinced by the the causality narrative proposed or or. or persuaded that that this version is more congruent with reality and instead more by whether this is the plot point that we were rooting for whether this was the the story development that we were rooting for we are reacting to events not as critical historical thinkers but as disappointed fans. I agree, I agree, I agree. I think let's not forget that movies are being made for, a, if I understand correctly, mostly for an audience of a teenage, te- 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 teenage a, a boys age, ages, I don't know, 14 to 19, whose maturity is doubted and, is, and their IQ is pretty low. So, a, a, so, so in that, but, but they are the audience. You have to appeal to them if you want to make money. This being said... All the chronicles of all the rulers of all the dynasties in Europe, and I assume it's the same about other cultures as well, always tell us about the heroic great victories of the king and the defeats of the king's enemies. So it's not that there is something new here in creating one-dimensional stupid narratives of good guys, bad guys. We've lived through it forever and ever. It is, I'm going back to something one of you said earlier, it is extremely powerful because we are experiencing it visually and and the impact is more immediate and and I assume that, yes, there is a difference. I'm thinking of my, I'm, 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 I'm Anna Karenina, right? There is a difference between reading about a woman jumping in front of a train and reading it over five pages and seeing it in two seconds on a screen. Yeah, sure. It, it's a completely cognitive different experience. Yeah. And, and then the question is, what what are we left with when we are culturally, societally trained only to experience and to expect the one? Right? You know, I, I remember there, there are a lot of books that I read growing up that, to me, read as as if they were written to 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 be adapted into scripts rather than to exist as novels. And I think that that's a problem that plagued literature basically since the 40s probably my concern is that this is 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 becoming much more widespread and escaping the the realm of entertainment and the people whose stock depends on on targeting the the right demographic but leaking out onto the onto disciplines like history, sociology, and, and, and political thinking. Like one conversation that we had a lot, and I don't, I think in private, I don't remember if we actually got into it um, on the previous podcast, is my personal uh, vendetta <laughs> against the, 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 the way history as a discipline is treated in many um, American universities compared to what I've had uh, the, the pleasure of experiencing in Israel. I feel that things here from and again i have had a limited experience but my limited experience involved some of the best supposedly best schools in the country and some of the the methods and the, the premises of studying history was not about finding that complexity 
but was much more dogmatic, was much more a new version of promulgating a winning narrative. It, it's just was, it's no longer the winning narrative that was promulgated in the 60s or in the 40s, but, it's, but it is, still has the same thrust of, of um, political authority. And I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just the nature of, of academia in the U.S. That, that it can't help but becoming dogmatic it doesn't that there's no history of 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 appreciate like when you try to offer them the the french variety of appreciating contradiction and 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 languid absurdism it it gets scoffed at like what's the use of that i don't understand this this is these are up in the air ideas i want give me something i can use so the the utilitarian nature of americanism makes everything more pragmatic which means in the case of academia, more dogmatic. But, 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 I, I, I don't know enough about America, American politics, American history, America in general, but I do want to point out to you, one, the French have their black spots, dark spots, they don't want to touch, just like any other nation. Two, the project of rewriting history of the U.S. is so recent this is a country based on racial injustice and racial discrimination. And this has been the case until the late 1960s. So the process of rewriting it, the process of looking at complexities is extremely young. I have a colleague who teaches the history of the Visigoths, which, if I'm not mistaken, occupied Spain from somebody in the 7th century. And she teaches it in Ivy League University here on the East Coast. And there are huge fights uh, in different American history classes about imperialism and race and colonialism and all kinds of things. And she says, I'm so lucky no one speaks for the Visigoths. <laughs> this is very recent. I mean, so many of the so many of these fights in European history were fought hundreds of years ago. Mm. One thing I will say though, just from over the course of my lifetime, as as much as there's all this like it, it, current controversy and fights about you know who to, who has a narrative what what is history what's the history that we tell i i still think that i don't remember in my in my younger years americans paying attention this much to our own history ever before i feel like that that is in in kind of for me anyway like a silver lining of our current moment mm -hmm. i mean eddie izzard who's a comedian had this great joke uh, in one of his series was like americans we don't have history you know 50 years old burn it down put up a parking lot like that was the american <laughs> concept of history until not very I, 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 for me at least i'm i am somewhat heartened despite how controversial and 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 hot the conversation is that at least we're engaging with history in a way that i don't i don't remember americans thinking about and you know the 90s, at least in the level of common discourse. I'll, I'll, I'll quote you to yourself, Moshe. But I, we probably don't remember what we had a, a happy hour drink a, a few years ago before you moved back to uh, Jerusalem or to Tel Aviv. Where do you live now? Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? Between, to Israel um, from, from New York. And, and you said, I, 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 I just miss living in a place that has history. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but, but, but the same thing is happening in, you know, the same thing happened in Israel in the 80s, right? There was suddenly this new historiography of Zionism and of yeah. the state of Israel. And, and let's incorporate the evil things that have been done to the Palestinians into the narrative and let's see if the state of Israel as a young state can deal with, incorporate absorbed, internalized its own evil deeds to other people. And the profession was steps ahead of the rest of the population. But I think by now the profession is a new consensus, and the consensus, the historical profession, is a new consensus, and the consensus 
It's much more complex than it used to be, and I'm sure that the uh, that the that American historians will find the right balance too between the the, the two narratives of, uh, of 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 righteous uh, righteousness and victimhood. Uh, but it's a conflict. It, it 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 always is a conflict, and it's good that it is a conflict. It should be a conflict. It's it's it, it's it's wonderful to be Norwegian and and and. and and not to have any conflicts and not to have any history. It's, uh, not everybody is so lucky. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I would just like to have to see more joy in the in the study of history and a little less g- grievance. Not not that grievances are are not allowed. Just uh, uh, no, sorry, not grievance. I would like to see a lot more joy in the study of history and a lot less less gr- constant grief and anger. I, you can have conflict in trying to to ascertain a narrative without this rancid rancor that comes with it in, in for, the U.S. Yeah. I agree, which, I agree. But this is a bad time. This is again. I'm a guest. I'm a visitor. Even though I'm a citizen, I'm not allowed to say that. But 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 I think there is anger because it's a, it's an empire in decline. It's it's like. Resources are dwindling and people are fighting over them. And resources is not only money, it's also access to power. And, and there are newcomers demanding their, 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 their share of, of, of resources and of, of, of power and, and, and voice and, and, and people with vested interests trying to protect their own interests. It's, and as long as, there's, as long as this country has been a country of prosperity and growth, there was no need to fight. This is not, I, I'm afraid that this is no longer the case, but I'm really saying it from the balcony. I'm, I'm, I'm staring at the drama. I'm not participating in the drama, and it's, maybe, it's, it's, uh, maybe it's unfair. But. One thing I will disagree with you, though, is in theory, conflict makes it interesting, and I think the introduction of narratives that, that were ignored in the past into the canon and to challenge the canon of Western history did a great job at making things a lot more interesting. That's why I, I originally took your class in, in colonialism and, and still am finding this issue fascinating because I think that the Western triumphalism narrative that exists is not only trite and corny and obviously misleading, it's also pal- like utterly boring. The thing is that I don't think that the new conflict is making things more interesting in terms of sheer um, intellectual entertainment value now, not, not morally speaking, not ethically. It's, I, don't, I think that the, the state of, in, of debate, of political intellectual debate in the U.S. is, is very tepid, very uninteresting. And I think we, we, we discussed once before just all the subscriptions that we find ourselves having to cancel in, in, in recent uh, months and years just because the language of, of trying to understand the world, rather than being expanded, is shrinking, is shrinking into a very narrow way of, 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 of um, moralistic uh, dichotomy seeking view very binary very dull no yep, no unfortunately i agree and 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 i will add even more that the we when we, you taught me we uh you first made me read foucault and and some of the great writings of of the, that are foundation of critical theory uh, my thesis for you was about critical theory which i still find fascinating in its foundation um, and i find it embarrassing that the way that some of the American right is criticizing it because it, it misses the value of it of, of critical theory as, as, as a, an analytical tool. However, once it got adopted into the mainstream, both in history as a discipline, but more generally in the intelligentsia of, of the United States, it has become not a tool to see the world more richly and complexly, but to, 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 to just have this very easy binary heuristic to judge whether something is good or bad are you are, are, are you with woke or, or not us. yeah no with those, uh, no I agree I agree I agree I agree um we are not intellectually culturally I agree we are not in a, the happiest of times 
we are less theoretical than we academic intellectuals are less theoretical than we should be. Again, I think it's because the because the fight because the issues are, are, are really huge and the vested interests are huge. It's about gerrymandering, but in the metaphorical sense and not in the political, geographical sense. It's how do we redistribute, redivide, redraw the maps of access to power and to knowledge? And, and, and gerrymandering is vicious. And, and I'm not sure there is much space for ambivalences. What is beautiful about French theory, and you mentioned it, it happens completely in the abstract. It doesn't deal with the concrete issues. What is wonderful about... There is something wonderful about the ability to ask metaphysical and moral questions and to spend all your time thinking deep thoughts when your wife does the cooking does the shopping and takes care of your children. That was the advantage of 19th and 20th century scholars, right? They could devote all of the time to thinking in the abstract, to living in the abstract. We're no longer there. You cannot not dirty your hands because we are aware of the fact that we are living in the world and therefore have this or that amount of responsibility and this or that amount of even guilt. I'm constantly flying. I'm constantly consuming resources from next generations, right? I'm dooming them to die. This is a moral issue. I deal with it by ignoring it, but this is a huge moral <laughs> issue. I think most of us, most of us are like this, and I think Europe has gotten used to it over a long time, and the US is just starting to deal with this kind of issue. So I'm not talking about flood the fear of flying, I'm talking about other manifestations of it, which, as I called it earlier, right, the, the, the gerrymandering of, of, the, of the country, uh, the distribution of, of, of intellectual resources. So it's possible that the sort of open, joyful wallowing in the, in the ambivalence that I seek mm -hmm. from history and from intellectual pursuit might be a thing of the past, a privilege that, that we, we just can't A privilege of when everybody anymore. knew their place. Yep, absolutely. Look, I'm, I have a student now who is writing about a non-political topic, a great topic, sex in public spaces in Paris in the 19th mm -hmm. century. What could be, what could be best? <laughs> Urinals, bushes, benches, street corners, <laughs> roofs. It's a, one could argue that it's completely apolitical. It's just sheer fun, and it's wonderful. When you think about it, or when I force him to think about it, you see how political it is, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is about young people living in extremely small apartments with only one bedroom, with girls having to preserve their virginity, otherwise their fathers will kill them, and boys are scared to death of getting girls pregnant, and the only place to have sex is on the roof or in the basement or in the drive, drive-in but uh, no, they didn't have any drive-ins in the 19th century. Um, and, if it's in, if it's urinals, public urinals, it's about gay men not having any other place to have sex and so on and so forth. You see how the state, the family, the state, patriarchy, dictate even the joy of sex in public spaces. So even a topic that could be looked upon as apolitical is completely, completely politicized. To think intelligently, historically, means to be aware of the extreme politicization of, of absolutely everything, for good and for bad, because we can also not say the opposite, right? We cannot say, oh, we don't want a state to intervene. We want a state to intervene. We want a state to prevent husbands from raping their wives. We want a state to get into the bedroom and arrest this husband. So even this is completely complex, right? And there is no black and there is no white. We cannot say, oh, the state has nothing to do in the bedroom. The state has a lot to do in the bedroom. But then we have to say, oh, when does the state, when should the state get into the bedroom and shouldn't it? It becomes, again, a matter of access to power, 
access to conviction, convin conviction, in, 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 in a space of disagreements. Of course, it's contentious. Thank you, Moshe. I'm going to invite you again to talk specifically about sex and power. I think that's an, another issue that we wanted to yeah, get into. So if you do decide to wait here until you get vaccinated, well, we'll hopefully see you again soon. Thank you, Enoch. Next time I come, I'm not off here, but I do have reasons to come here. Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. Follow us on uncertain.substack.com and wherever you get your podcasts. We are Uncertain Pod on the social media. Please give us a five-star rating if you're listening on Apple Podcasts and share it with your friends and enemies. Until next time, stay sane. I have no tea to sip anymore. <laughs>